What a great song for all the ones. We celebrate you. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're a guest, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're watching online. But we're in a journey. Last week I gave you the overview of understanding who we are. We're entitling this series, Mirrors, What Reflection Do I See? And the tool that we're using is called the Enneagram. If you're not familiar with the Enneagram, uh, that's okay. You will get familiar with it, but understand this. Everybody catch this, because I even had to answer some questions after the last service. The Enneagram is an ancient tool. I mean, it, is, it, it can actually be traced back at least 2,000 years. It's a phenomenal tool. It's the most accurate tool I've ever seen in discovering who you are, your personality, the personality types of those around you. The purpose of this is not to label each other. Okay, it's to understand yourself better, understand why you do the things you do, uh, and what really has uh, added to, enhanced your personality type, maybe impacted it positively and negatively. There's a lot to this, okay, more than just uh, a, a quick answer. But uh, at the end of the day, it is about loving God, loving others, and loving yourself. That is the greatest command of all. And a lot of times, Christians will talk about, well, yeah, you know, I know it's about loving God. No. Jesus said the greatest command of all is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as who? Yourself. If any part of that triad is out of whack, you're out of whack. I'm out of whack. Okay? And we can't truly love the way we are called to love. And there is an epidemic in our culture of loving yourself the way God made you. It's critical, guys. It is absolutely paramount to not only your life, your happiness, but your relationships. And I do not say this lightly. I do not take this lightly. I believe over the course of this 10 weeks, you will see marriages saved, relationships rescued. You'll see people backing off the brink of disaster and coming to a place where they're healthier than they've ever been before. And I can say that with great confidence because I have immersed myself in this study for a year and God has transformed my, my life, my wife's life, our family, and just to be honest, it hasn't been easy the whole time. All right? Now that song goes all the way back to the 70s, Carly Simon, Nobody Does It Better, the old spy who loved me, Roger Moore, James Bond. But I want you just to think about it. Nobody does it better. Ones, if you are a one, nobody does it better than you because you are so committed to excellence. You are so committed to doing it right. But since we're talking about the ones this week, we're talking about the reformer. Now, I, I don't particularly care for some of the names that ones are given in the Enneagram study. And believe me, there are hundreds of books written on this. So all you need to do is pick up a copy of The Road Back to You. We have a copy here. And I didn't even tell my staff this, so now I'm going to have to apologize. But somebody called me last night and said, I will pay for anybody who can't afford to have that book. And so she's willing to pay for everyone who needs a copy that can't pay for it. Now, if you can pay for it, obviously, uh, it's just the cost that we're giving it to you at. But if you can't afford the road back to you, pick up a copy. She's going to write a check to the church uh, for anybody that can't afford that. We have the, the book. We have the study. How many of you started your small group last week? Raise your hand if you started it last week. Great job. If you're not in a small group, about half of each service, get in a small group. It's not too late. You say, well, I don't, you know, I don't know if the small group would work for me. I mean, I'm only off on Wednesdays. We have over 140 small groups that are getting together every night of the week in different locations. And if we can't find one that will fit you, we'll get you the material, the study guide, the DVD, the book. And you can do it with a couple of your friends. You can do it on your own with your family. All right? We just don't want you to miss out on this journey. So normally, if you read the road back to you, you read some of the studies that are out there, uh, it starts normally in, in teaching with the eight, and then it moves all the way uh, to uh, the seven, all right? So it's eight all the way around to the seven, but I'm an eight, so I'm not starting with me, okay? Uh, I want to talk about and really begin with the one, and I want to kind of show you something. If you look over here, this mirror is a great indicator of how we see ourselves spiritually, emotionally, sometimes even physically. Obviously, that impacts us physically. But, you know, if you had a mirror like this in your house, 
you'd either condemn the house or buy a new mirror, all right? But, but we have mirrors like this in our lives. And the one sees themselves this way. They are their harshest critic. They see themselves as a perfectionist. Some of you are going, what's wrong with being a perfectionist? Probably because you're a one, all right? But, but a lot of people go, aren't we supposed to be perfect? Um, good luck. Because nobody is except Jesus, all right? So perfectionists uh, are always under stress. They're always under demands to themselves. And they never measure up. They're critics. A lot of times when a one is unhealthy, they are so critical of themselves, their spouses, their kids, and everybody around them. They're uptight. You know, if you know a one in your life that isn't healthy, they never laugh. They rarely smile, okay? They're controllers. They try to control. And they're judges. They're kind of like, they consider themselves the referees of the universe, they got a flag in the back pocket. They got a whistle around their neck. Boop, foul, number eight, 15 yards, get back. It's kind of how they see themselves when they're unhealthy. That is an unclear perspective. It's a, it's a wrong perspective. And what we want to get to is a clear perspective of the one today. Okay? Now you may say, well, why do I need to hear this? I'm not a one. Because you have ones in your life. And you've been called to love them. And allow them to love you. And because they will make us better if we learn how they are wired. All right? So they're lovable, acceptable, forgivable, valuable, uh, and capable. That's true of all the numbers. That's never changing. Those are the five ways that God sees us. But a healthy one is dependable. You give one a job to do, they get it done. A healthy one is principled. I mean, they are so principled. I mean, they never, ever waver. They're like, hey, it's right. God wants me to do it. I do it. They're, they strive for excellence in everything. They're purposeful, faithful, forgivable, or excuse me, purposeful and faithful, and you saw the other words. Now, here's what I want you to do. There's a little piece of paper in your bulletin. I want you to take it out real quick. Everybody do this, everybody, Okay. I want you to see if you're one. How many of you have already taken an Enneagram test? Raise your hand. All right. Wow, that's a good job. Good job. So put your hands down. A lady came up to me and she's like, well, so what do you do if a person in your group refuses to take the test? I'm like, are they a one? They said, yes. I said, So just pray for them and be patient. It will happen. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to answer these, okay, real quick. If it takes you more than 30 seconds, you're definitely one. Just put the piece of paper down, all right? But here's the deal. Um, Put a check next to each characteristic that describes you most of the time, all right? So I value excellence. Now, even the sevens in the room are going to be like, I value excellence. Like, I want the party to be excellent, I want the fun. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, the one is like excellence in everything. A one makes their bed with zero wrinkles. They put the throw pillows on it every day. I know, because I is married to a one. So when I make the bed, I put the throw pillows on it. I like, man, I hope this passes inspection today. All right, so... Anyways, I want you to sign these excellent integrity, justice, self-discipline, and then the negative, judgmentalism, perfectionism, self-criticism, and resentment. If you got four or more, there's a good chance that you're a one, all right? And so today, I want to talk to you about that. Now, ones strive for perfection in everything. And let me tell you about perfection. Perfection is like an ice sculptor. You ever seen an ice sculpture? It's beautiful. It's perfect as long as the climate is right. But when the climate changes, it's a puddle of water. And once that's what happens. When you think everything in your life has to be perfect, it will work out as long as everything falls in place. But when it changes, it all turns to water. Okay? So after really the past year of being immersed in this study. Here's my definition of the reformer. My wife even asked a question because she's one. She said, honey, why did you choose the word reformer? Because, you know, a lot of books use perfectionist, um, evaluator. And I said, because I think all of the other words start with a negative connotation. And honey, 
I don't see you as negative. <laughs> and that was the first good thing I did, you know, in a long time. But anyways, I said, honey, you're amazing. And so you're a reformer. When I think of reformers in history, I think of the Reformation because I'm a history guy. Let me tell you about a guy that changed the world for all of us. His name was Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther King changed uh, the world for everyone in the 60s for civil rights, and that was amazing. But I'm talking about a guy that lived hundreds of years before Martin Luther King. His name was Martin Luther, and he was a monk, and he was in absolute pain. He was so sickened by his own depravity that he used to beat himself until he passed out with a whip. He, he thought he had to do the, pray the rosary every day, go to confession multiple times a day. He was a good Catholic to the nth degree. No sexual thoughts. No, not, you know. And he just lived this life that he couldn't measure up to. And one day he's reading Romans chapter 1, verse 17 that said, and the just shall live by faith. And he went, oh my God. It's about God. And so he went home and he wrote 97 reasons why the Catholic Church had lost its way. Listen, if you sit down and write 97 things that somebody needs to change, you're a one. Okay? And then he takes them and he posts them to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany, and it begins the Reformation. He's super excommunicated. That means he couldn't eat or drink or borrow or trade. Guys, he was a reformer. And reformers will change your life. Now look at my definition. The reformer is rational, an idealistic perfectionist who is deeply principled, self-controlled, and constantly dependable. So I told you that every week in the services, we're going to talk about a person that Jesus encountered that is the number of the week. I'm going to talk about a story. Even if you're not a Christian, even if you're watching and you're an atheist, you've probably heard the term, the prodigal son. You've heard the term, the lost son. It's one of the most misunderstood and poorly taught stories in all the Bible. As a first, uh, at first glance, the biggest mistake is that we call it the prodigal son or the lost son. You look in your Bibles at Luke chapter 15, and that's what it will say as a title. But that's not what this story's about. Look at Luke chapter 15, verse 11, and let's read this together out loud. Here we go. Then Jesus said, once there was a father with two sons. Oh, there's another son in this story? The squeaking wheel always gets the grease. The bad boy, the bad son, he gets all the press. The kid that goes off and wastes his life and shrinks down into the deepest pit of depravity. But what about the oldest son? Why doesn't he get any attention? Because he was a one. And from the time he was little, he did everything he was supposed to. Now, I want to just give caution to parents real quick. If you're raising more than one child, and one of them is a one, remember the other kids are just as spectacular as that kid. He's not perfect. She's not perfect. And on the flip side, make sure that you affirm them for their greatness because what happens to ones a lot of the time is everybody just expects them to always do the right thing and they always do the right thing, but they never hear anybody say, you're amazing. Thank you for doing the right thing. Okay? We're going to come back to this. This is critical, guys, but I hope you're catching it. Now, I, I did not grow up in a home with a one. My mom isn't a one. My dad isn't a one. I don't, I'm pretty sure my brother isn't a one. But I'm going to tell you what they are. They're all three different than me. Okay? My mom, my dad, and my brother are, are easygoing. They're not risk takers. Like, they don't like pain. They're, they're you know, they're, they're calm. I know this. I don't have to ask my parents. I know that many times after running me to the hospital and dealing with the things that I did, and I wasn't the kid that went out and got wasted and, you know, did all kinds of stupid stuff. I did, well, I did, but they didn't know about it. Um, and so, but I know there were times that they had to be laying in bed and they looked at each other and went, where did he come from? <laughs> my dad's like, are you sure he came out of you? 
There's no doubt because I'm so vastly different than the three of them in that way. All right? I mean, I don't find pleasure unless there's pain. I don't think I've competed unless I hurt the next day. Even in my condition, I still have to have a challenge. I'm an eight. That's how I'm wired. You know, if it's not challenging, if it isn't painful, if it isn't something you have to work at, it ain't worth doing. And a one's like, you're insane. This is, this is God's great sense of humor. He put me with my wife. She's a one. She likes order, structure, spreadsheets, uniformity. I like chaos, insanity, always on the go. It's like, what was he thinking? As a matter of fact, a lot of times, ones look at God and go, what were you thinking? I, I think I could get this right, God. Now, this is the story of two sons, okay? And let me give you just a little bit of history of what happens. At this time, 2,000 years ago, you're going to see uh, a young son who most likely is a seven, an unhealthy one, who comes to his dad and he wants his money. He wants his inheritance. Look at this in Luke chapter 15, verse 12. Let's just go on with it. Jesus said, once there was a father with two sons. We established that. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think it's time to give me the share of your estate that belongs to me? Uh, the father should have said, uh, hey, dummy. No, I'm not dead yet. When do you get an inheritance? After your dad dies, if you're lucky, okay? He's like, Dad, now I'm pretty sure, even though we know, guys, hear me on this, this is not a true story. This is a parable. When Jesus told a story about real people, he used their names, he used ge geographic locations. When he told a parable, he didn't use specific names, he didn't use you know, personal pronouns, but it's a true principle. Obviously, the big picture is it's God's love for all of those who are lost. It's also God's grace for a child who has become a Christian and wandered, but it's also the story of two lost sons. One is lost in his depravity, the other is lost in his legalism. One is trying to find joy in being disobedient and getting all of life he can, squeezing everything he can out of the worst things in life. And the other son is trying to get his father's uh, gratitude by doing everything right. Both are lost. But look at this. You may never have seen this before. So the father went ahead and distributed among the two sons their inheritance. Did you ever catch that? He gave them both the inheritance. He didn't just give it to the brother. So 2,000 years ago, when you were a son, if you were the oldest son, you got two-thirds of all the inheritance, all the land, the animals, the money, all of it. Two-thirds. If you were the youngest son, you got one-third. If there happened to be a sister, they got a dowry. So there was a certain amount of money they got to make them more appealing in marriage. Yeah, it wasn't right. It wasn't good. That's just how they functioned 2,000 years ago. So the oldest son actually got two-thirds of all the wealth. That means, think about this, keep it in mind as we move forward, he actually owned the majority of everything. So here's what happens. Both sons get their inheritance. I want to I point out the positive of ones. The things that when a one is healthy, they do naturally. And I want to make sure you understand this. As a one hears this, I know I had a long conversation with my wife last night. As a one hears this, they still have a hard time hearing the good in what I'm about to share. Because they are their harshest critic. Ones, look at me. Oh, now I know who you are. <laughs> I love you, and God loves you, and you are extraordinary. The world needs more ones. We need you, okay? I want you to see if you can relate to these principles of the one. First of all, he sees the reflection of a nearly perfect child. 
When a one looks, this older brother, he looks and he goes, I'm a pretty darn nearly perfect child. Actually, he says, I am a perfect child. Perfectionism uh, will kind of lead you to that end, but he is truly like a perfect child. If you're raising a one, you don't have to tell a one what to do more than once because they do it after that. If you want to know whether or not you're raising a one, just watch two or three kids when they sit down to have cereal. You pour their cereal and the one goes, whoa, hold on. He got more than me. She got less than me. It should be even. And they're three. Okay, so you pretty much know that. They're all about that. They're about fairness and justice. He sees a nearly perfect child. You know what else he sees? A flawless employee. In those days you worked for your father. He worked for his father. And he was flawless. I mentioned that up front. You leave the company in the hands of a one. You leave him in the best hands. Heck, you might leave him in the hands of someone that does it better than the owner. You know what else he sees after a flawless employee is he sees the reflection of a serious and seldom playful son. Now what that means is when a one is doing a task, they do it right, they do it completely, they do it to the nth degree, and they're seldom playful on the job. Now, I, I know that some of you who are ones are like, well, wait, that's not very nice. I mean, I'm never playful. I didn't say that. Just said that you're serious when you're doing a task so much that you take that task serious. You're not joking about it. Remember years ago, my buddy Greg Steer and I, right before we started the church, I managed the tire store. It was a very slow period of time, so we made a movie <laughs> in the tire store. When I showed my wife and my mother-in-law, they were appalled. <laughs> that is a place of business. I'm like, yeah, there was no business. We're just enjoying a day. Relax, okay? They are seldom playful. And then he sees the reflection of only the dependable and trustworthy son. Dependable and trustworthy, guys. Now, those are all extraordinary qualities. If you are a one, those are fantastic qualities. But here's the problem. Here's what will harbor deep resentment in you. The phrase he sees is followed by, it's not fair. It's not fair. How come he goes off and does what he does and I've been flawless as an employee, I've been a perfect child, I've been serious on the job, I've been dependable, I've been trustworthy. It's not fair. And I say this to all the ones, life isn't fair. Nobody knows that. Let me tell you, more than a pastor who's buried six-week-old babies, six-year-old kids hit by a car, 96-year-old people who have suffered with disease. 33-year-old kid last week. Yeah, life isn't fair. It's broken. And that doesn't set well with a one. Because they're all about fairness. They want life to be fair. Now here's what ends up happening. We're going to read the rest of this passage because it's really, really critical that you hear it. If you're a one and all you can see is judgment, you're critical, you've got to step back a little bit and get a clearer perspective. In this story of the two sons, it's kind of like those pictures. What are they called? Like stereograms or whatever, where, where there's all these dots on a piece of paper and you look at them like there's just a bunch of dots. And if you look at the whole picture, you miss the picture. But if you focus in on that middle dot or one of the dots in them, all of a sudden this 3D image comes. You've seen them, right? Okay. That's what this story does if you see it from the perspective of the reformer. Look at this. So the young son, 
after wasting his life, guys, he had done it all. Prostitutes and drugs and alcohol and the worst kind of depravity. And he's wasted every penny of his inheritance. And he's eating the food of pigs. And he's like, what am I doing? So the young son set off for home. From a long distance away, his father saw him coming, dressed as a beggar. And great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son who was returning home. So the father raced out to meet him. I want you to stop there. God runs to us in our sin. He runs to us in our brokenness. He doesn't say, hey, come on, you know, just to do, do 50, you know, prayers and Hail Marys and go to church every week. And uh, He says, no, 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 I love you. I just want you to change your mind about what you've been doing. You do that, I'll meet you where you're at. Matter of fact, I'll beat you to where you're at. And he swept him up in his arms. He hugged him dearly. He kissed him over and over with tender love. If you have children, you can sense this right now. Then the son said, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me be a... And he's about to say, let me be a beggar or a servant. He might even say, just let me come home and die. And look what the Bible says. The father interrupted him. In the midst of your hatred for yourself and your self-loathing, loathing, stop. Because God is saying, stop. Right now. Not just to the to the son who wasted his life, but to the ones. Son, you're home now. And turning to his servants, the father said, quick, bring me the best robe. Do you know what the best robe was in those days? It was a robe that only the the patriarch wore in the family, and it was reserved for only royalty. My very own robe. And I will place it on his shoulders. Bring the ring. The seal of sonship. What is that ring you put on when you get married? What does it symbolize? The beginning of a family. He says, put that ring on his finger. And I will put it on his finger, actually. And bring out the best shoes you can find for my son. Because, guys, in those days, servants didn't wear shoes. They were barefoot. So he says, bring out the best shoes. Bring out the air sandals. (laughs) And let's prepare a great feast and celebrate For this beloved son of mine was once dead, but now he's alive again. He was once lost, but now he is found. And everyone celebrated with overjoying joy. (laughs) Overflowing joy. Now here's the deal, ones. I do make mistakes, all right? But here, listen, I want to say this. Everyone celebrated except the reformer. And I'm going to tell you something that I believe to be absolute truth. Can't prove it. But having been around once, the reformers, the son knew what was happening. The older brother knew what was going on. At the first sound of screaming and hollering, woohoo, and shouts, and, and, and dad running to his son, he knew what was happening. You can't lie to a one. Look at me. I've tried. (laughs) You can't do it. They see right through you. Here's my wife's favorite thing to do. Whenever my wife asks me a question about something that didn't get done, she's actually not asking. She'll say something like this, "Um, Honey, did you drain the cooler and shrink wrap it? If you want me to translate what she's actually saying, it's this. Honey, you did not blow out the cooler, cover it, shrink wrap it, tape it, make sure it's ready for winter, right? (laughs) If I ask the question, I'm on trial. And I better answer accurately, okay? In this moment, the son knew what was happening. Now the older son was out working in the field when the brother returned, and as he approached the house, he heard the music, the celebration, and the dancing. Ones are brilliant. He knew what was happening, so he called one of the servants over and asked. All he was asking was for confirmation. What's going on? 
The servant replied, it's your younger brother. Oh, that idiot? That idiot. Stupid, foolish seven. I wish he'd have died when he was there. Well, he's returned home, and your father is throwing a party to celebrate his homecoming. And the older brother's like, what? He became angry. He refused to go in and celebrate. So his father came out and pleaded with him. He made his father beg at his feet. Come and enjoy the feast with us. Now, I want you to see what happens with the one, and this is a very unhealthy one, okay? The son said, Father, listen. I want you to stop for a moment. Can you imagine saying to God, hey, listen. Because ultimately, when you disrespect authority like the authority of your father, that's what you're doing. And he says, son, Come on in. No, no, no. You listen to me, Dad. I'm done listening to you. How many years have I been working like a slave for you, performing every duty you've asked as a faithful son, and I've never once disobeyed you? (laughs) Okay, come on. Never? Ever? See, what happens in perfectionism is that you even have to deceive yourself at times. He did have moments. He's human. As a matter of fact, I'm going to prove it with his next statement. Look at this. But look at this. You've never thrown a party for me because of my faithfulness. Never once have you even given me a goat. And you're giving him, you know, a steak that I could feast on and celebrate with my friends like he's doing now. But look at this son of yours. Look at this idiot. He comes back after wasting your wealth on prostitutes and reckless living. How do you know that? Guys, there was no Snapchat, no Instagram, no Facebook, no telephone. How did he know that? He also got an inheritance. Maybe he was just better at covering up his sin. And here you're throwing a great feast to celebrate him. My wife said this in our discussions because she's helped me most in understanding all of this. She said, "Um, you're a boat rocker and I'm a rule follower. She has always been that. I have known her since she was 12. Literally, there was a glow around her. (laughs) I, I, I went to this little Christian school my parents put me in and everybody's like, Shelley Bartholomew is the perfect child. I went to her house. Her parents were like, our daughter's perfect. I'm not kidding. She was literally perfect. The only trouble she ever got into, very close, I was there. As a matter of fact, we were going to have a basketball game, and the bus was coming, and Shelly happened to mention that a girl I was really interested in, her friend was coming over, and that her dad was on the road driving a truck, and her mom was at work, and I'm like, hey, what if me and my buddy, who liked her, come over to your house, eat a little food, whatever? <clears throat> She's like, oh, I, I'm not supposed to do that. Ah, oh, it's no problem. I was like the devil in the garden, man. It'll be fine. Your dad just doesn't want your eyes open to reality. So we went over. We got there. She's making some food. I'm elbowing my buddy. This is great. The door opens. It's her dad. Came home a day early from truck driving. He walked through the door in his cowboy boots. He couldn't see me, but I could see him. And I was like, oh, shoot. And I grabbed my buddy. And we ran out the back door and we leaped a 10-foot chain link fence in a single bound. We were faster than a locomotive. And we got over to the school. And he's like, oh, dear God, did he see us? I go, I hope not, because he will kill us. (laughs) Seven years later, he's my father-in-law. All right, that's a whole other story. So here's the deal. Guys, let me show you the son's deepest struggles real quick. Here they are. One, see if you can relate to this. He doesn't see how disinterested he is in others' achievements. One's 
a lot of times you look at all of us and go, why should I tell you good job? I've been doing this forever. You're supposed to do it right. A lot of us do a job and we're like, hey, hey. You know, I, I'm, I'm a person that, you know, I'm like, uh, um, honey, hey, welcome home. Like, yeah, how was your day? Good. Yeah. I cleaned the whole house. <laughs> she walks by like, uh, big deal. I do that every day for fun, pretty much, okay? So... He has a serious but, in his mind, justifiable anger problem. Okay? He's angry. Now, let me tell you the sad part about the anger of a one. It turns into something insidious called resentment. You see, my wife and I fall in the same triad. You'll understand this as you go through the book. The eights, nines, and ones are in the gut triad. And our underlying struggle is anger. But we manifest it very differently. If I'm angry, you know it. It, I really don't get angry very often, but when I do, you know it. My wife gets angry. She's like a crock pot. Every now and then the steam comes out of little places. You're like, hmm, hmm, boom. And it doesn't manifest the way it does with me. She's not yelling. She's not screaming. She's just saying things that rip my heart out and cut it into a billion tiny pieces. Right? You know what else he does? He makes the father grovel for his forgiveness. He makes his father grovel for his forgiveness. Once you you have a tendency to do that if you're unhealthy. And then he is filled with self-pity and emotes self-righteousness. Now, the pro in this, because we always want to find the positive from this, is that at least he says it. At least he says, I am angry. I am mad. Now, the best reflection of a reformer is Jesus. Okay? He is the best reflection of all the numbers because he's perfect. Was, is, and always will be God. Okay? And he manifests that perfection in this story of the two sons by loving the prodigal who was off wasting his life. Okay? But, but look at how the father responds to this. The father said, my son, you are always with me by my side. Everything I have is yours to enjoy. It's only right to celebrate like this and be overjoyed because the brother of yours was once dead and gone, but now he's alive and back with us again. He was lost, but now he's found. The one says, I don't care. Literally. He has wasted his entire life, and he's hurt you, he's hurt me. You see, the core motivation of a one isn't relationship, it's righteousness. It is justice. It is perfection. Now, ones, we need that. And let me tell you something about the church today. The church in America has done a poor job of celebrating the reformer. We celebrate the prodigals all the time. Oh, so-and-so, come up and share your story. Well, for 10 years I was stoned, didn't know where I was. I bought a prostitute every night. I lost all my money. I, I was this and I was that. Well, oh, but I came to Jesus. Woo, praise God. Reformers, you don't have that testimony. Your testimony is like boring. You're like, well, I got saved at 42 months. I've always gone to church. I I was a valedictorian of kindergarten, first grade. I did go crazy once. I had a Pepsi free. And I went home and put the canned beans with the tomato soup. I was out of whack. Literally, that's it. Listen to me. We need to celebrate your goodness. We need more stories of ones who say, I have followed Jesus since my youth. We need your story. And church, we need to celebrate it. But let me say this to the ones. The reason it doesn't get celebrated is because of that inner struggle. And before I give you these parting words that I know will encourage you, I'm just going to say this. Here's the biggest struggle, and I put it in your sermon. The biggest struggle for a one is they should all over everybody. 
They should not, come on now. They should all over themselves. They should all over their kids. They should all over their coworkers. They should all over their neighbors. Look, the ones who are like, I just can't believe he's saying this. This is terrible. This is, I'm finding another church. No, they do. They should all over everybody. You should do this and you should do that and you should go there. You should go there. Now, here's the deal. Their core sin is anger. It manifests in resentment. You know, this reflects poorly on an incredibly amazing person. Now, the ones in my life, and I don't just say it because my wife is extraordinary, and I celebrate her oneness, but I say because there are many ones in my life. We have ones on our staff. Let me tell you how great ones are. Guys, twos through nines are the ones who go, oh, I might go to church, I might not. I might give financially, I might not. Ones are like, I go to church every week. I give every time I get finances. I pray for everybody. I serve. They look at people who don't, and they're like, what's wrong with you? It's the right thing to do. Most of us are going to heaven right after Jesus because of the ones. Because they have committed their lives to do the right thing. So once, let me give you this challenge. Healthy reformers reflect fun when they are, first of all, flexible regarding their agendas. If you want to have fun ones, you got to be flexible. And I know that's hard. It's hard to be, ref- to be flexible when you're a one. But you can do it. You're going to learn this week how to do it. You're going to get a great tip from Brittany, our pastor of small groups. She gave us last week's tip was submission. You know, that's how we can all learn to submit to Christ and submit to one another. This week you're going to get another one. Don't turn that DVD off after you hear from me until you've heard from Paul and Brittany. Okay? Make sure you listen to all uh, this week. They're flexible regarding their agenda. Second, they're understanding about others' imperfections. They're understanding. When you're understanding ones, you have more fun. People are imperfect. And most people around you are more imperfect than you are. And finally, notice other people's accomplishments. Ones are not going to flatter you. If you are married to a one or you have a one in your family, just understand this. They are not going to heap words of praise on you. I used to think that's because my wife didn't think those things. But she does. She thinks those good things. And so if she says, honey, that was a good sermon. That's like, whoa, that was the greatest sermon ever. You're amazing. You're the best preacher in the universe. I love you. That's what it means. (laughs) It just comes across like that was a good sermon. All right? Make sure that you notice other people's accomplishments. If you don't, you will be dictated to by anger. And look at the danger of this. Don't let the passion of your emotions lead you to sin. Don't let the anger control you or be fueled for revenge, not even for a day. Don't give the slanderous accuser, the devil, an opportunity to manipulate you. Ones, you have a tendency to let that resentment build. You can't count people's sins against them. You're like, that's how I go to sleep. One sin, Rick sinned here. Yeah, I don't count sheep, I count sins. No, love covers a multitude of sins, okay? And so you've got to give people that opportunity. Now, for the rest of us, how do we love and celebrate and just really relish the ones in our life? Well, first, you need to love and appreciate their perfect timing and well-planned lifestyle. My goodness, if we go on vacation... I actually plan our vacations. But once I've got all the big pieces in place, my wife plans every single detail meticulously. You just ask my kids sometime. When we go on vacation, we have fun. Because they don't have to worry about a thing. All right? Um, we, bought, we, we borrowed a pop-up when we were impoverished from a friend in the church. Before we got in his pop-up, my wife had made a list of things we need to put in his pop-up. 
We've done that forever. She's meticulous. You know what else we need to celebrate? Their commitment to detail. They are detail-oriented. Where would we be without the ones in this ministry? Where would we be in our families without the ones? Celebrate it. Love their commitment to detail. And finally, their passion to improve and increase productivity. Guys, if you do this, the reformers in your life will make you a great person. Do you know how humble they are? Even though they are fighting internally with holding themselves to a standard they can't uh, ever achieve, they want you to achieve greatness. They believe in you. They love you. You know, I, I look at my wife's most selfless person in our family. She's given up everything. There have been times where in the midst of our struggles, she has reminded me, that this life that we have lived, because there have been some very difficult days in ministry, many. And she has spent not one day of her life outside of the aquarium of ministry. And she had to say it one time, I didn't ask for this. In the heat of passion and anger, and I, I heard another guy talk about this. I'm like, it's crazy how pastors have so many similar stories. But 33 years ago, or no, it was only 31, 32 years ago, used to be that when we got in fights, we would be perfect until Saturday night. And then we just blow up and fight and argue and not be talking. And I'd sleep on the couch, then get up and go to church and preach and lead music and say, you know, bless you, my child, God loves you, right? I'm happy to report that for 22 years, that has not happened. Now we fight on Fridays because we have Saturday services. But anyways, I, uh, so there's those struggles, okay? And years ago, I was like upset. I'm like, you don't appreciate me. You don't affirm me. And, this, and I'm screaming. And she goes in the bathroom. And I'm yelling through the bathroom door, the bedroom, yelling through the bedroom door. And, and I am not proud of this. I'm disgusted by this. But I said it. I'm like, why is it that... That hundreds, even thousands of people love me. They love me, but you don't love me. And she's like, because they don't know you like I know you. <laughs> Game, set, match, right? <laughs> Guys, here's the deal. Jesus came into the world, and once you need to understand this. At the end of the cross is a bloody, battered, beaten Savior. It's a mess. It's gross. Because all the sins of all the world were placed on him. And he died in our place. To give us perfection. We won't achieve that perfection, that sinless perfection, until we get to heaven. He died so that when God sees us, he sees Christ's perfection. And by believing that Jesus died for you, his perfection will be put to your account and you will go to heaven. Because of what Jesus did. You don't have to try to achieve it or become something you're not. Stop holding yourself to a standard ones that you can't achieve. None of us can. We are all broken by sin. God loves you. I love you. And I want you to just give yourself a break. And for the rest of us to learn to love the reformers in our life, they will make you great. Let me have you bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. If you're here, and you've never come to the place in your life where you've actually put your faith and trust in Jesus, I want to challenge you to do that right now. Just, just right where you sit, you can just say this to God in your mind. Say, God, I admit it, I'm a sinner. God, I've done things wrong. But right now, today, I believe Jesus Christ died on a cross for me. And right now, I receive the free gift of salvation he purchased I thank you that he died and rose again. And right now, Lord, I believe. In the very moment that you put your trust in Christ, his spirit comes to live in you. His righteousness is put to your account. You will go to heaven, and I want to pray for you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward in just a moment. I'm going to ask you to raise up your hand and put it right back down. That just lets me know you got it. So if you're saying today, 
I receive the free gift of salvation. I put my trust in Jesus Christ. Would you just slip your hand up and put it right back down? God bless you. Thank you, dear. God bless you, guys. God bless you. Thank you. Praise God. Celebrating your hearts, Christians. For you who did raise your hand, you're going to heaven. You never have to do that again. You're born again. You're going to heaven. No matter what you do, Jesus died for that. But he wants you to live for his purposes. And we want to help you do that. We, we do something here that makes it really simple. If you just text the word believe to 313131. Pastor Scott will give you a call. We've got a gift for you. We want to welcome you to the family of God. We want to help you grow. Ones, we love you. Father God, thank you for this amazing time with these amazing people. And God, may we take your word to heart and be transformed by it. Thank you for the reformers. God, help them give themselves a break. Help them love themselves the way you love them. And help all of us love and appreciate them because they are majestic and amazing. Lord, we worship you now. In, in this closing song, we lift our voices to you in Jesus' name. Amen.